Well, thanks for that, Angie. And yes, I'm up here in a balmy Montreal for our annual visit, checking out the new release from Autodesk, chatting with Philippe Soro, who's the lead product designer. And I started by asking him about the 2016 release and the overall philosophy behind the workflow changes. For us, it's definitely to bring closure to a number of things that we kind of left um, open in the 2015 release cycle. It was uh, um, unfortunate for us that some things had to be uh, left out of the scope of 2015. Um, we did a lot of investments over the past three releases, I think, on introducing much better and much tighter timeline integration into the application with the reels, uh, the flow graph, uh, reinstoring a recursive BFX workflow. So lots of stuff had been happening over the course of the 2015 release cycle. This is much more about also bringing closure to more of the desktop component uh, of the workflow. And that's been really, uh, I mean, we said that it's something that was very dear to us, uh, but we believe that 2016 actually really brings closure on the overall workflow, uh, definitely tying uh, in a very unprecedented way, I would say, um, the way that uh, Reels Flow Graph and the Timeline can really work together in the context of batch, in the context of the desktop. So, um, so yes, the goal for us is to really reach a workflow plateau. Uh, over which we're going to continue to build. Um, and so it is a bit of a, you know, I think it's still, you know, a bit of a, uh, an adjustment for users who have been following us uh, on this um, workflow trek, I would say, uh, in, in the wake of the anniversary release. Um, but it's definitely the last one. I think I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to say at this point that we feel we've reached really closure on the overall core application workflow. And we think that it was very important actually to make that investment because it is part, it is really an essential part of what makes Flame a Flame. It is the way that you operate it, the way that you can very easily navigate from a view that exposes more than just one clip, more than just one thing in the player, uh, more than just one flow graph. Uh, all of those things are, uh, I think, very essential just to making an application more than just the sum of its parts. and. Um, and ultimately, it's kind of the value that you can't necessarily, um, it's, it's a harder to sell uh, a thing to do, but it's an essential component of what actually makes Flame fast at the end of the day. So it was essential for us to make sure that we brought it to the level where we wanted it to be, and, and that's definitely the goal that we had with 2016. Well, you mentioned fast, and one of the things that's fast about using the software is muscle memory. And over the last several releases, um, there have been a lot of workflow changes, kind of slows that down. Um, in this release, while not as major as the anniversary release, uh, there's still even more workflow changes. Uh, would you say this is the end of those big changes moving forward? In terms of button uh, and button placing, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be so sure because you know there are, I think, other areas of the application that still need some attention, and of course, it means that as we modernize them, they also get affected by by things in the UI. So button placement is still likely to change in some components. But I think what I mean to say is that the, uh, the, the baseline workflow of the application, how you interact with the timeline, how you interact with the reels, how it relates to the flow graph, all of those things I think at this point have reached a plateau and are unlikely to change in the future. The structures that we support at this point whether, you know, what we introduced in, in extension to uh, which we call, you know, the real groups and now the batch groups that have been complementing this in the context of 2016, those are structures that are here to stay and are not going to change in, uh, in the future. We, make some, we may make some adjustments based on the feedback that people uh, will, will give us once they start um, using them, but, uh, but overall the skeleton of the workflow is going to remain what it is in 2016. Uh, people have been requesting all sorts of modernizations across the application that we haven't necessarily got to, and that also means that some portions of the UI are still likely to change in the future, but that's part of a modernization, I guess, um, process more than anything. Well, we're going to take a look at some of those workflow changes in just a second, but now I want to switch to creative features uh, in the software. Uh, starting out with some significant architectural changes to the way that effects are applied to media layers uh, within action. Yeah, I think this is part of a, an overall, as I said, um, uh, plan that we've had to gradually work our way through critical components of the application. And we've reached the point where we're, um, we're 
we're starting to focus on the very essential case of action. And uh, in the context of 2016, indeed, there is an important thing that has happened is that we've, we've essentially solved, uh, you know, uh, one of the complaints that people had in the past about using um, what we've called the indirect modules of action, the keyer and uh, the color corrector through the media, through the media layers, um, that they, they tend to be slower uh, than the rest of, of the batch process. And indeed, it's because it was still, it was still kind of a, a pipeline of its own that we hadn't had a chance to actually replace with uh, with the actual um, batch rendering pipeline. So in 2016, that's now something that's taken care of, um, which means that uh, whether you choose to use the color corrector as a media effect in action or as an external node in batch is not going to come at the cost of a performance. Of performance, um, it's 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 going to be more a choice of what matters, what context matters. Um, and if it's more relevant to do something in the context of action, then there's not going to be a cost, uh, a performance tax associated to it anymore. And the, the changes have been rippled through any instance of action, so they also benefit desktop action for those who still want to use action as a separate module outside of the batch environment. Uh, all, of the, all of the architectural work that we actually uh, did uh, for action uh, spreads across all of its instances, and now batch as a module in the desktop is behind the scene absolutely identical to uh, batch as a node inside of action. We just don't present it the same way to you. But same performance, same, same underlying architecture. So that's, uh, that's great. An interesting side effect also of, of doing that modification is that things that uh, uh, used to be kind of agglomerated, like the color corrector and the color warper, which were you know, in, a, in this weird module uh, that used to be or composition. Uh, yeah, so the, the, that, that's gone. Effectively, they've been replaced by their, um, you know, their uh, batch counterparts, which means that they are now separate. So you, you, can, you, can, you can choose to have a color corrector and a color warper simultaneously, which is not possible. Also, things like the blur uh, is now the blur node underneath the hood, so you have access to the actual full blur functionality of the, of the batch node as, a, as an editable uh, module through the media list. So there's some interesting advantages that come with that change. Well, the reason I brought up the new media layer processing is because I think it's important to understand that and how it relates to two new features in Action, which are both Matchbox support as well as Lightbox. Uh, let's talk about first about how Matchbox was implemented in Action. Yeah, so, you know, from, from, from the very beginning when we introduced Matchbox, uh, I mean, we, we we tested the waters, uh, seeing whether the, uh, the, the Flame user base was open to something that uh, you know, would involve some kind of custom development. Um, and, uh, and it turned out that, you know, yes, the, through, the, through the, actually the, the involvement of, of few key people, um, there's, been, there's been actually a, a, a lot of uptake in, in using Matchbox um, to produce custom-based effects or uh, bring functionality that we cannot bring to the application in a timely fashion. Um, and and we've, uh, we've gone from introducing it in batch to placing it also in the timeline, and now we're placing it inside of Action. It, those, it's the same Matchbox shader, but they don't necessarily provide exactly the same service to you. Um, in batch, that's probably the most commonly used. It's a node. Uh, you bring it in a flow graph. In the timeline, it's a real-time, almost a real-time process that you can actually just add on top of, 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 a, of a timeline layer in an editorial context, which makes it you know, very fast to do some adjustments. And in action, uh, even though it is the same shader, it is something that operates in the antechamber of the action scene. Uh, it, op it operates on any texture that uh, action is going to use. Uh, and when I say any texture, uh, this can be, you know, whether it's a displacement, uh, it's, whether it's a normal, whether it's a diffuse texture, all of those things that eventually get applied onto a geometry that is then represented in the scene, Matchbox can actually affect. Um, and, and it delivers a very non-linear uh, method of applying effects to things that ultimately get represented in, in the action scene. 
um, in batch, you have to parent things, you know, you have to create less, literally a serialized flow graph. Um, in action, uh, we present Matchbox in the form of a node in the schematic that can get parented to multiple textures instantaneously and therefore affect them very quickly. We use the priority editor to deal with priorities of these effects between them. Um, and that happens after the media pipeline. So all of a sudden you have, first of all, an extraordinary diversity of effects that can be applied to um, to textures inside of Action. You can also use it to extract information from textures, such as extract normals. And actually, we have our own matchbox that we're introducing here that does that directly in the context of, of, of the Action scene. Um, but again, the, the method of applying them is very different. And in some instances, I mean, even though you can think it's a bit more convoluted because it's applied to texture, there are things that you can do very quickly as a result of that because it's not tied, it's not bound by the serial uh, mechanisms of the actual batch flow graph. It, it gets instanced, it gets, um, it gets um, daisy chained, much, uh, uh, much like any kind of action like node um, uh, in the schematic of action. Uh, so very flexible and very fast, very fast. So taking things a step further is the new Lightbox that while similar to Matchbox in some ways, actually brings a whole new level of shading possibilities albeit to the entire uh, 3D scene. So Lightbox is a, is, a, is a very different beast. I mean, although technically speaking, it is still a shader, you know. Um, but uh, really when we thought of Lightbox, and we have, you know, we had been kind of envisioning this uh, for many years, and we thought, you know, it would be really cool to have like a, kind of like a look development tool that would be aware of what happens in the actual action scene. Uh, and that would not make a discrimination between something that's a geometry or something that is an, uh, you know, a textured image, for example. And, uh, and so Lightbox is effectively something that is a combination of a light, a kind of color correction uh, tool, um, and an adjustment layer uh, in the Photoshop sense of the term. Uh, but because it's a, it's a kind of like a combination of, of these three concepts, it can do things that neither separately can do. And, and so it introduces the concept of actually literally projecting effects into the action scene and understanding and mitigating the effect of, uh, of, of the shader uh, with the position, the distance, the angle of incidence, kind of like a light does. Uh, uh, but at the same time, instead of actually, sh you know, shining light into the scene, actually shining an effect, and uh, and and it inherits from 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 an adjustment layer, it inherits the capacity to do things like blend modes, but it does so really in three D space. Uh, so you can start casting something like a gamma correction. Uh, into your action scene and decide that it should be combined to the scene through uh, multiplication, okay? Um, it also understands priority, just like in adjustment layers. And so we use also the priority editor to convey the fact that you can daisy chain these shaders together, but decide in which order they should be actually applied through each light. So, uh, so it's, it's definitely a departure from, from what you would know with, uh, let's say, traditional look development. And we think that in a very similar way to um, you know, the reasons why we chose to introduce something like an action G-mask, uh, the fact that you would deal with certain problems in the action scene allows you to deal with certain integration problems where they actually appear, as opposed to upstream in the media, and trying to tackle those and then see what the consequences of those changes are downstream, which is a very kind of like serial type of flow graph type of workflow. And of course, they complement each other uh, very well, right. uh, very well. So, so in, an, in essence, Lightbox is also for the first time us opening the floodgates to uh, custom development directly inside of the action scene. So you can you can create your own effects. You can completely sample the entire action scene if you want to. Everything is actually available through the Lightbox API that we are providing. So what's the complexity of actually creating a light box shader compared to creating a matchbox shader? Um, I would say that it depends what you want to do. Uh, for simple things, uh, you know, if we talk about basic color correction uh, stuff, pixel-based operations, 
it's not that complicated. Actually, the API offers you various levels of uh, proficiency. Uh, if you are a pro of, uh, of code development, we actually literally expose the guts of action to you. So you can do, you could go as far as reprogramming repro entirely the lighting in action if you wanted to. You could do that, okay? Obviously, this is not something that a, you know, this is not something I could do, <laughs> okay? Uh, but some people can. And so if this is what you want to do, we let you do it. Uh, but at a very, uh, at a more basic level, we provide you with a framework, an API that's going to take care of a lot of things. Like you don't, you don't have to think about distance and sampling stuff. It's the, it's action that's going to take over that. You can just focus really on the pixel um, on the on the pixel manipulation aspect of things. And so, as I said, there's a very simple level um, and it goes all the way to a very pro level where ultimately you could even go as far as reprogramming the action rendering if, if that's what you wanted to. It's a comp more complex task uh, again, um, uh, but it is possible. We expose enough information for you to do that. We're going to be taking a look at actually using one of the provided uh, Lightbox shaders a bit later in the interview. But before we get to that, uh, one addition that Lightbox provides is a brand new scene linear mode. Yes, we we uh, that's something that is uh, that is definitely uh, new for the first time. I think we have a scene linear environment, which is action, uh, in which um, the light box shaders that we provide actually, um, that are, um, you know, definitely inspired from the color corrector, uh, you'll see components of it that we've actually transformed into, uh, into light box shaders. Um, in the context of action, what we've done is uh, we allow you to at some point declare that uh, this is a scene linear scene that you're working on. And at that point, action is going to make the assumption that everything that is in there is scene linear. And for the stuff that um, action authors, such as the substance materials or the lens flares that use also substance textures, will actually take care of automatically see, you know, converting them to scene linear. And the, uh, the, the color corrector version, light box version of the color corrector, sorry, I should say, uh, will be aware that you've actually activated the scene linear mode. And it's actually going to adjust itself so that um, it is still capable of performing uh, the changes that you would expect from the color corrector, but in a very consistent way uh, compared to what you know working in video space, for example. So, uh, so underneath the hood, uh, the API, the Lightbox API, this means for people who want to develop their own um, Lightbox shaders, the API can actually surface the status of that button and you can decide whether or not you want to actually change the behavior of the shader based on on that setting or not. Uh, and again, as I said, we will perform automatically conversions for the things that we control and a very good example is anything that comes from the substance engine. Uh, and, and at that point, we will adjust the shaders also. Most of the shaders that we, um, that we package with 2016 that are um, color correction shaders for the most part. Uh, we'll take that into consideration and make sure that we perform operations in the appropriate space and deliver consistent results. Uh, on, uh, also, one thing that we've done to, uh, to facilitate the process is that we've also, we're packaging a number of a, a display lookup tables that are more modern uh, to deal with scene linear. So they, they do um, very appropriate tone mapping. Um, we didn't remove the old ones. They're still there for legacy purposes, if, this, if those are the ones that you were using. Uh, but we're definitely thinking of retiring them probably in the context of a future major release. Uh, but they're packaged, uh, they're packaged as part of the, uh, of the viewing environment and automatically assigned to, uh, to um, uh, lookup table slots uh, of every project. So working with these, and in scene linear mode will deliver something that's visually very consistent. One thing in the last several releases and now with the addition of Matchbox and Lightbox is that the schematic and the UI are getting harder to use and more complex. Um, do you feel that's a fair criticism? No, no, it's a fair criticism. I think that, um, you know, and it's, I think to your point about can we expect buttons to change in the future, I think that, you know, action is, is definitely, as I said, um, 
is a place where you know our we're turning our energies uh, uh, on action uh, these days uh, have been for uh, for the past months and of course we realize also that we're reaching the limits of some of the concepts that are very powerful in action the limits of the schematic the limits of some of its navigation navigational components um, and, and clearly, this is something that we would love to revisit in, in a future release. So I think, you know, I think it's a, it's a fair criticism to say that it can get very complicated, um, even though to do simple things, it's not that complicated. Uh, it's just when, when you start piling up a lot of these various objects, uh, I agree with you that uh, um, there's a lot that can happen in a schematic, and it can be a bit daunting for people who are not necessarily familiar with all these concepts to um, uh, to control simultaneously uh, to do something inside of action. So definitely something that we would like to revisit in a future release. I think one thing that Lightbox shows is the need for a new or and or improved renderer within action. Um, I mean over the last several years you've seen really big improvements in real-time rendering in game engines like Unreal. Uh, as well as GPU physically based renderers. Um, is a new renderer something that you think uh, flame artists could look forward to in the future? I certainly would hope so. Uh, I think that it's, uh, uh, it is something that is uh, instrumental, I think, to the future of flame. We've always, we've always seen flame really as an integrator. Um, and, uh, and I think that integrating things together in the context of an artistic process no longer necessarily means exactly the same thing as it did 20 years ago. I think the original title for Flame was it's an image integrator. I think that if we look at the future, I don't think we should certainly, we should certainly not constrain ourselves just to image integration. I think the key thing is to make sure that Flame remains or has an environment that is capable of very effectively dealing with both 3D and 2D in the same environment to make artistic decisions artistic decisions for integration, uh, for integrating these things together, okay, and making them play together nicely. Um, and in that context, yes, I think that having um, high quality um, rendering techniques is something that is absolutely vital uh, for the product. I can't make any promises, of course, I, you know the drill, uh, John, but it's very fair to say that it's something that is, is being thoroughly investigated. Okay, in the past you've talked a lot about the fast interactive performance in action and how important that is to the Flame experience. Um, are you opposed to having a renderer that takes a lot longer than that interactive preview? Well, today I think that's already the case. I mean, if you if you activate certain options, uh, you know, the actual rendering is going to be a lot longer than the interactive preview render that you have as you're manipulating your action scene, for example. You know, without the motion blur and the anti-aliasing and stuff like that. Um, so it's uh, definitely not certainly not close to to the idea. I think the the. The, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is always, you know, what are you likely to do inside of Flame when you combine those things together? And, and I think the, 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 the answer that um, uh, comes to mind for me immediately is that you try to make it look good and, you, you, and make it work with the rest of the shots. And that does not necessarily mean always for it to be physically accurate. So, um, I think that high quality is one thing, uh, physical accuracy is another thing, um, and what matters in Flame is that you have very effective way, interactive ways of bending the rules so that you get the image that you want. Well, one thing I've thought about a lot when people talk about having a physically based renderer within action is kind of be careful what you wish for. Um, I think a lot of flame artists, clients, uh, artists themselves want to have a lot of art direction over effects uh, and they're seeing things like shadows and that's, that's one thing that you're going to lose if you have a true physically based ringer, uh, physically plausible maybe, um, but, but what do you think about that? So I think that, you know, and, and again, I, I don't mean to say that um, you know, a physically based renderer is out of the question inside of action. I think it's very clear now that um, interactive, um, physically accurate renders are making long strides towards um, 
interactive rendering, okay, GPU-based rendering. So this is definitely not something that is being ignored. However, I do think, uh, because of the very nature, again, of what you do inside of Flame, that if we were to support something like that, it would probably be for a restricted number of use cases. Um, because for the most things, for the most part of the things that you do, even inside of Action, the chances are that you will not necessarily be you know, rendering things with um, index of refractions and stuff like that. It doesn't really matter that much. It, maybe it will in some very specific cases, but that's why I think that the primary rendering technology of, of Flame should allow you to hack your way through things um, because that's what you do, uh, you know. And, and, and there are certainly limitations as to how much hacking you can do if you're bound by the laws of physics, okay? And, and so again, I'm certainly not excluding the fact that, you know, um, a physically accurate renderer could make its way inside of action. I do think, however, that it would probably need to be a secondary rendering um, engine. Uh, for, for action that you would be ready to use with a certain number of constraints that come from physical accuracy. But that side by that next to it, you would have something that would still be very high quality, but would allow as much hacking as you can, um, as you want actually for that matter, or as your customer wants, as your clients want. Well, one thing about the rendering discussion is I think it kind of informs us as to who your target customer is. Um, there's a wide variety of customers out there from feature films to commercials to episodic TV to indie. Um, when you're looking at adding features and improvements to Flame, uh, who's the customer that you're actually targeting? Uh, it is primarily focused on what we call the high-end commercials uh, market. There's obviously, um, you know, Flame is also used in TV episodic. It's also used to some extent to uh, prepare broadcast promos and, and and things like that. But the core market is definitely high end, high end commercials. And I mean, for us, it's interesting because it is still a place where you know even people, if people say that you know client attended sessions are kind of wearing off, I still think that if you look at the creative process overall, um, we will continue to have the need for something that acts as a creative integrator. In other words, a place where you make decisions that have an impact, a critical impact on what the finished product is going to look like, what it's going to feel like, what story it's going to tell. And those decisions are typically not made in a big committee. Uh, kind of like editorial. So, you know, again, if you look at the, the whole process, I like to refer to it as the ebb and flow uh, of, of the creative process. There's a time for concentrating decisions, there's a time for executing decisions, and of course the number of people is not going to be involved, it's not going to be the same. Pipeline is about execution at a large scale because you need that throughput and you need to secure uh, release dates and things like that. Um, but concentration is going to be essential to actually bringing uniformity, to bringing you know, decisions that um, that will definitely affect the visual impact, definitely affect the way that you tell the story, uh, how, those, how the pieces are actually coming together. And Flame, again, uh, what I was saying earlier is Flame is first and foremost, I think, an integrator. And it so happens that it is also a story-centric integrator. And the future of what an integrator is is something that is both capable of dealing with live action as much as it, it is capable of dealing with animated geometry without having to make compromises on either. And I think that's what's ultimately going to dictate our technological choices. Uh, because you want to still have an environment where interactive artistic decision making is possible with the context and the impact and overall view of, of what it means for the rest of what you're focusing on at a specific moment. So, you know, it's more like the story centric approach of things. And I don't think that that is going away fundamentally. There will always be a place for something like that, a process like that. And we would like Flame to be that process, of course. Well, switching gears a bit and, and taking a look at the market conditions, it's been a last uh, tough uh, last couple of years in the market with uh, budget pressures and workflow changes and things like that. And it kind of brings up the question as to whether Autodesk is, stands behind Flame with such a limited target market. Uh, do you feel the company's committed to flame? Uh, and if so, how? 
Well, I mean, you know, I think that there's been doubts about that for years. Um, but I mean, honestly, uh, the the size of the team is is pretty much the same. has been has been staying constant over the years. Uh, um, we we're actually uh, at this point we're uh, we're all based in Montreal, literally at this point. Um, very focused. Um, so I think that you know. Flame has undergone a, a great number of changes, and some of them have not always been instantly popular, let's put it that way, um, recently. The fact that we are continuing on a roadmap and a vision that I've actually in many instances uh, you know, shared with you as much as I could, it's been like incremental sharing. Uh, but I mean, I, th I guess you can see that we're kind of walking our talk, and, and we've been doing that, I think, you know, very persistently over the past years, even though the last couple of years have been, you know, uh, somewhat challenging because of, of the reaction to some of the changes and, and also the changes in the industry that are undergoing, like a lot of pressure uh, also from our customers. Um, but you know what, we're, we're still here and we're still delivering strong releases and we're still investing major efforts in modernizing a 22-year-old application. So I think hopefully that speaks to the commitment of Autodesk. Um, you know, I can't say what tomorrow will be, but uh, this is the reality that we're in right now. And I don't think it's a bad one. We've been able to do great changes in the application. And I don't think, you know, I don't think it's a given that you can, you can create such ambitious, um, What's the word? Uh, a reform, reformation of, of the application. It's uh, it's not easy to sell internally. Right. <laughs> so before I came up here, I posted on the Logic Face Group page, uh, asking people to add any questions for you. And something that came up quite often were revisiting uh, old creative tools, things like text and paint, uh, and even particles in action. Um, with all the workflow changes you've done, architectural changes, in addition to creative tools, how do you feel about the balance between those things and the need to kind of revamp and revisit those standard uh, creative tools from the past? Oh, that's very, very hard. Um, I think what you will see is that if you, if you look at uh, the way releases are, are structured, and I think I, ex I explained that also on Facebook, is that you know, we, uh, we, we tend to have two types of releases. Um, I guess uh, one release that one style of release that we would call strategical, where we introduce things that may not necessarily have been requested, but we believe are important to take us where we would like to be with the product. Uh, so, um, and they're tactical releases, which are more about solving problems that are um, arising very quickly, or you know, are dictated by um, a very sudden change in the industry, like, you know, whether it's stereo, uh, we had a tactical, I guess, response to, uh, to stereo. 4K is another one. I mean, it's obviously here to stay. I mean, I don't think, you know, we're going to necessarily go away from higher resolution imagery, um, but that would be tactical. Um, so the previous extension was more of a tactical release. 2016 for me is more of a strategical release in so far that it's, uh, it introduces workflow concepts, but also, um, I think, artistic concepts that we think are very relevant for what we want Flame to be in, in, in the future. Uh, striking a balance between the two is very challenging, extremely challenging, uh, because you can't do everything. And, um, and so I think we were asking me where we stand right now. Um, I think it's fair to say that I think that with 2016, we've, uh, we're, we're finally turning the page of the workflow changes. And that's something that, uh, um, you know, I wish we had been able to do it in the 2015 release cycle, but um, development sometimes takes time. And I think it was the right decision not to rush these things out, especially when they touch the core application workflow. But I think we're turning this page. And already with 2016, as I said, we're, we're we're already focusing our energies on things that are absolutely critical, I think, to, uh, uh, to the creative identity of the product, like action. Um, 
So how this is going to translate in the future releases, I cannot promise, um, but it's, it's, that's the position in which we're in now. We are turning our energies onto something, you know, other critical artistic components, creative components of the application, and, uh, and that's what we will be focusing on in, in the next foreseeable future. That doesn't mean that things like conform or you know, um, processes that are absolutely essential for, for the application to be efficient on a day-to-day -day basis for our customers, that doesn't mean that they're taking a, uh, you know, that we think that they're less important, um, actually quite the opposite. But, uh, um, but I think we're at the stage now where we're, we're ready to uh, look more in depth at, at um, the core creative tools uh, in the application. As far as paint and text are concerned, it's a recurrent topic, and and I have to tell you that it's uh, you know it's there's no question on our side about how much this is used in the field. Uh, it's it's just that uh, we we have to make sometimes very very tough choices, and and uh, and for us it was essential to finish the workflow of the application, um, put in place some architectural changes that are an investment for the future, and they happen at the detriment of those things. And, uh, um, and this, I understand why this generates frustration, and I wish we, uh, we had more resources to tackle those things simultaneously. The, the truth is that, unfortunately, we, we can't. So we have to make those choices. And right now, I have to tell you that um, I'm much more in favor of, again, investing a lot into the action core component than I would be, for example, to invest in something like paint. Um, and um, uh, and I, I know that this is a frustrating topic, but I, I do think that at this point it's the right place to invest. It's the right place also to, it is what makes Flame also different from a um, from a creative standpoint, if we do, if we play our cards right. Now, philosophically speaking, I think there are kind of two general ways you could proceed with a new text tool, and that's the old school character generator or more like an illustrator uh, text-based design tool. Um, speaking hypothetically, of course, which, which do you see would be more attractive in its place in Flame? I, I think it's probably neither. Um, uh, it's definitely not the uh, character generator. I think really is if you want to have something that allows you to have more of creative flexibility, then it needs to, I think it needs to be in, in a place where um, that's conducive to that. And I think right now it has to happen in, in something that is, you know, capable of understanding textures, lighting, orientation, depth, things like that. Um, and so it, it places, as I said, it places action as a very strong candidate to be um, the host of, of, of new text functionality. Um, and historically, you know, in, 20, in version 2010, we, uh, we, uh, we, we started an effort and then it was, um, it got stopped in, in, in the light of other stuff that we thought were more important uh, with, uh, with a new shader pipeline that was introduced inside of Action. And I think it was also the right decision at the time to, to do that. Um, so, so I think that really, if I had to uh, summarize, it would be more like a 3D illustrator, I think, that, is, that would be really the ideal scenario for Flame. OK, so I want to bring up the L word. Well, actually, two words, and that's uh, logic ops. Uh, when you remove the Logic Ops tool, uh, substituting and replacing it with the Comp tool, um, you, you actually upset a large part of the user base. Uh, in 2016, though, you've finally made some changes to hopefully make those people happy. Can you walk us through the changes to the Comp node in this release? Yeah. So the the one thing that you know, I think the LA user group was was an eye opening experience in in you know. Um, Understanding how important, uh, you know, uh, some uh, the way that uh, people interacted with Logic Op, how important that was. Um, the front back mat conversation happened x number of times over the various forums, and so um, clearly, you know, I think it's 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 something that I personally underestimate, like the impact that that would have. And so, in the context of 2016. 
uh, we we decided to to act upon that feedback, and uh, and so you will find that that the the comp node itself actually abides by the same rules as the former logic hub. So the one thing that you know I I I'm very adamant about is I don't want to bring back logic hub. It's really it's old code. It's uh, it's not something that I think is is good for for flame ultimately. Uh, uh, so I think that what we fixed in the comp node is the things that you know people struggle the most with, and and it's bringing back F1, F2, front, back. Uh, the connecting scheme also is the same as Logic Up at this point, um, and so hopefully this will go a long way at addressing some of the concerns that we heard over and over again, and that quite frankly took us all by surprise. Uh, and there's only so much um, ignoring that we could do. So actually, you know what? We never really ignore. It's just that sizing how important it was to mm -hmm. users is not always that easy. And I think that um, like the user group experiences are are great for that because mm -hmm. you 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 kind of um, have a sense of how how something can impact a user base like live uh, with a group of people. And so you know, and over all those conversations, the message was received. And so we made some adjustments, and hopefully. Uh, they will make people happier uh, to use the comp node. Well, there's another L word, and that's luster. Uh, is luster dead? No, it's it's not. There's uh, it's fair to say that there is little happening in it. But you know what? It's it's not dead. Um, actually, in the context of 2016, uh, we are uh, we're actually implementing um, HDR, uh, the support for HDR uh, in luster, and it's the only product of Flame Premium that is getting that. Obviously, because it's in the segment where Lustre plays, that uh, where it's the most relevant right now, and it's it's film DI, um, so it's it's still under development. It's not our primary focus um, as a development team, but it's not dead. Uh, we're uh, we're we're continuing to uh, uh, to bring new functionality to it, albeit not as much as some people who only do grading would wish for. But it's still something that we're supporting, and we are continuing to develop. Uh, and and so, and I think I've said that a number of times, but it's also a question of people not necessarily believing it. But I think you know, our intention is still to continue to develop Bluster and maintain it uh, for as long as we think that you know it's capable of providing a service that Flame on its own is not capable of providing. Now, some people may interpret this as me saying that Luster is going to make its way inside of Flame. And every time this comes up, I say, no, 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 this is not what we intend to do. Um, I think what we're interested in doing with, with color correction inside of Flame is making sure that it has the tools to actually deal with look development as a very much more broader um, process than just color. And in the context of finishing, Color plays an essential part, but look development generally uh, um, is is extremely important, and 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 it's not only about color. It's it's throwing anything that is required at the image to make it look the way that you want, and in that respect, we would want Flame to grow to be able to be autonomous in that respect in the context of finishing. That's a very different statement from saying that Luster is going to be in Flame. Uh, there, uh, that's not really the uh, that's not really the intention. Well, why don't we give people a break from looking at us and dive in and take a look at some of the new features in the software? Sounds good.